Good morning everyone, welcome to the second lecture of module 7. If you recollect our discussion in the previous lecture, we discussed about two different coal conversion processes that is carbonization and gasification. However, in this lecture which is a continuation of same topic that is energy from coal, we will discuss other two coal conversion processes that is liquefaction and combustion process. So, let us first begin with the coal liquefaction. Coal liquefaction is a process used to convert solid fuel. So, solid fuel here is referred as a coal into substitute for liquid fuel such as diesel and gasoline. And this coal liquefaction process was extensively used during World War II due to unsecured supply of petroleum and the successful research on coal liquefaction by hydrogenation began in the early 20th century. If the crude oil supplies are completely disrupted, then the coal liquefaction may be used in future for the production of the oil for transportation and the heating application. And that is the importance of the coal liquefaction process because in case the supply of the crude oil completely disrupted in future, then the coal liquefaction process may be used to produce oil and the produce oil after using certain upgradation technique and refining can be used as a fuel for transportation or can be used as a fuel for the heating purpose. These coal liquefaction process are classified as direct coal liquefaction and indirect coal liquefaction. This direct coal liquefaction process is further subclassified as pyrolysis, solvent extraction and catalytic liquefaction process. And this direct coal liquefaction refer to the direct thermochemical conversion or you can say the hydrogenation of coal at relatively high temperature and pressure to produce liquid fuel as a product. Similarly, the catalytic liquefaction of coal produces liquid fuel as a product. So, all these processes are direct liquefaction process here and these process are carried out at relatively high temperature and pressure. However, this indirect coal liquefaction process it begins with the gasifying coal. So, in this case the coal first need to be gasified with oxygen or steam and then converting these produced gases that is carbon monoxide and hydrogen after purification to liquid. So, liquid produced here are liquid fuels and the petrochemical by the fischer trop synthesis process. However, the produced gases after purification can directly be converted into a methanol using methanol synthesis process. And because of that this particular process is termed as indirect coal liquefaction process because in this case the coal is first gasified with the oxidizing agent or you can say the oxidizer that is oxygen and steam to produce a gaseous product that is carbon monoxide and hydrogen and these produced gases after purification converts into a liquid fuel and there it carried out using the fischer trop synthesis process. Also it produces the petrochemicals and the process also used is the same that is the fischer trop synthesis process and that is why it is termed as indirect coal liquefaction process. However, in these processes the coal is directly converted into a liquid fuel using a thermochemical conversion and that is why these processes are termed as direct coal liquefaction process. And if you recollect, we discuss in detail about FT synthesis process that is conversion of gases to liquid or petrochemicals in one of the lecture in module 4. As a reason, we are not discussing this part again in this module. 
rather we will be discussing in detail about the direct coal liquefaction processes. So, let us first begin with the pyrolysis process. So, this pyrolysis process it involves heating coal. So, as the solid fuel we are referring here as a coal. So, it involves heating this coal to a temperature around as mentioned here 300 to 800 degrees Celsius approximately and the pressure used is around 0 to 7 mega Pascal. Sometimes the process is carried out at atmospheric pressure as well as sometimes it is carried out at relatively high pressure and it results in the conversion of coal to gas, liquid and char as a product. So, during this process the produced char is hydrogen deficient that means the char is mostly consist of the more carbon rather than the hydrogen and that is why it is termed as hydrogen deficient. However, this process results into a higher hydrogen rich gas and the liquid as a product and that is mainly because of the enabling of inter or intramolecular transfer of hydrogen during the process. And mainly in this process if you look at this particular uh, numbers here. So, the liquid product that is oil yield it is limited here in the range of 5 to 35 percent and in terms of char it produces more amount of char that is close to around 45 percent that of the feed coal and therefore, such processes are often considered uneconomical or you can say inefficient use of carbon in the coal during this process and there are number of commercial coal pyrolysis process which are available and the list of such processes is shown here. So, now let us move on to the next process that is solvent extraction process. So, in coal extraction process the coal is mixed with solvent and the solvent used here is hydrogen donor solvent example is tetraline. And as we can see here this particular solvent which is used in the solvent extraction process is providing the atomic and the molecular hydrogen to the system and roughly at a temperature up to 500 degree Celsius and pressure up to 35 mega Pascal. And if more severe condition than mentioned above are used then it is more effective for the removal of sulfur and nitrogen from the fuel as well as to produce a low boiling liquid product that is more suitable to the downstream processing. Since the low boiling products are getting produced at severe condition that is mostly a liquid product. So, handling or the operations of such low boiling product would be more suitable while carrying out the downstream processing of such intermediate products. And recently the tar sand bitumen or the heavy oils are being used as solvent in this process and also the commercial solvent extraction processes which are available for the extraction of such a liquid product are listed here. So, the next is catalytic liquefaction process. So, in this process a suitable catalyst is used to add hydrogen to the coal in liquid medium with catalyst being dispersed throughout or sometimes in a fixed bed reactor at a temperature range of 350 to 550 degree Celsius and pressure around 5 to 30 mega Pascal or in some cases the catalyst is mixed with the coal and this combined coal catalyst mixture is injected into the reactor. And the advantages associated with this coal liquefaction process is it eliminates the need of hydrogen donor solvent during this catalytic liquefaction process. However, there is a still need of the hydrogen and that need to be supplied externally during this process. And the limitation which are associated with this process includes the catalyst deactivation because of the presence of the mineral matter in the coal as well as formation of the coke during this process and these two factors may result into the deactivation of the catalyst. 
and in this case even the process efficiency is limited as the direct hydrogenation of the coal needs intimate contact of the catalyst and the coal particle and it depends on the coal particle size. For example, here if the coal particle size is not in the appropriate range, then it may not be able to diffuse into the catalyst pores and as a result it decreases the process efficiency. Therefore, the appropriate coal particle size need to be used during this catalytic liquefaction process to improve the process efficiency. So, this is all about the direct coal liquefaction process. So, now let us discuss about the physicochemical aspects of the direct coal liquefaction process. The reaction mechanism involved in the direct coal liquefaction process that is the conversion of coal to oil is very complex and the hypothetical and the variable chemical and the physical properties of the coal. So, if you recollect again our discussion in one of the lecture in this module, we discuss about the varying properties of the coal between the even types of the coal as well as sometimes between the samples of the same types of the coal also gives varying chemical and the physical properties and it makes difficult to understand the true fundamental process that takes place during the direct coal liquefaction process. However, a general reaction scheme for the coal liquefaction is given here and this direct coal liquefaction it proceeds through two loosely defined stages that is first stage is primary liquefaction and the second stage is upgrading primary liquefied product and that produces liquids like synthetic crude oils and this primary liquefaction here it involves the thermal fragmentation of coal macromolecular structure to produce free radicals which are capped by hydrogen and this hydrogen donation may be by the hydroaromatic solvents or you can say other donating species in the coal or by gas phase hydrogen. And this primary liquefaction steps produces the pre asphaltines as well as the asphaltines and oil along with C1 to C4 hydrocarbon and inorganic gases such as ammonia and the hydrogen sulphide. The pre asphaltine which is formed here along with the asphaltine are often called as a liquefied product because these two products are coal fragment soluble in the certain solvent, but they are in fact solid at the ambient temperatures. And this incorporation of this repolymerized insoluble organic material in the reaction scheme is conceptually very important, especially for. early stage coal liquefaction process. Because retrogressive reactions can occur to a significant extent and this occurrence of this retrogressive reaction have negative impact on the oil yield that is we can term it as a liquid yield here and that is mainly referred to the reaction in which this liquid fuel molecules break down into the gaseous 
product. And in summary, the main fundamental steps that are necessary to transform this coal to gasoline or distillates via direct liquefaction are coal dissolution in which the disintegration or the dispersion of the coal macromolecules will take place followed by the reduction of this molecular size to allow access to catalyst pores and if you recollect our discussion just one slide back there we mentioned that the catalytic liquefaction process is relatively inefficient and that is mainly because of the poor contact of the catalyst pores with the coal particles and if this reduction of the molecular size to allow to have access to the catalyst pores then eventually it results into increase in the process efficiency followed by the removal of the heteroatoms such as nitrogen oxygen and sulfur from the coal and then the hydrogenation of the aromatic rings and the ring opening of the saturated rings and next to that is the reduction of the molecular size to 5 to 20 carbon atoms and then it increased in the atomic H by C ratio to about 2 is to 1 and these are the main desired reaction or we can say the steps which are involved in the production of the liquid fuel via coal liquefaction. However, there are undesired side reaction which comprises of retroaggressive reaction as we have mentioned here because it results into decrease in the oil or you can say the liquid yield and the condensation of the polar materials on the catalyst surface and due to deposition of this polar materials on the catalyst surface the catalyst deactivation occurs as a result it decreases the process efficiency as well and the removal of the side chain from aromatic and the saturated rings because mostly the gas formation and then the dehydrogenation of the aromatics that decrease of solvent quality as well as the loss of hydrogen during this process and the successful completion of these steps during the coal liquefaction process results into the formation of the liquid product. The direct liquefaction process it produces a liquid product that is a synthetic crude oil known as sink crude. So, this is a product which is obtained during the direct liquefaction process and these sink crude obtained from the coal liquefaction are generally different from those produced by petroleum refinery as they may contain substantial amount of the phenols in its composition and therefore this coal liquid it needs further upgrading and the refining to match specification of petroleum fuel products. This sink crude produce after the coal liquefaction process can be further upgraded and refined into various petroleum grade products such as fuel gas, gasoline, diesel fuel and fuel oil. So, this is all about the coal liquefaction process. So, let us move on to the next topic that is combustion process. Combustion here it refers to the rapid oxidation of the fuel that is solid fuel accompanied by the production of significant amount of the heat and this complete combustion of the fuel is possible only in the presence of adequate supply of air or oxygen. For example, here in this case if you take a look at this particular equation here which indicates that this 1 mole of carbon is oxidized in excess air to produce 1 mole of CO2 and this much amount of the heat energy and that is per mole of carbon. And this principle of the combustion chemistry are significantly different when applied to fuel that is here we are referring as a 
coal as compared to the liquid and the gaseous fuels and when a solid fuel particle is exposed to hot flowing gas streams it undergoes three different stages or zones of mass loss that is drying that is the first stage followed by the devolatilization and normally it is termed as solid particle pyrolysis and the third stage is char oxidation and we refer it as a combustion process and therefore the proximate composition of the fuel significantly affects these three steps during the combustion process so the first is the drying zone or we can say the drying stage in which the drying of fuel takes place in the temperature range of 100 to 200 degree celsius and during this stage free and the bound moisture or you can say the water release from the fuel and this moisture it cause a non recoverable heat loss of 2400 kJ per kg of water and that is heat of vaporization of water and hence the high moisture fuels must be dried before feeding into the combustor or in the other word i would mention that the high moisture fuels need to be avoided for the combustion process and the next zone is the devolatilization zone that is also termed as a pyrolysis zone which is represented here according to three different temperature ranges so at first the pyrolysis occurs in the temperature range of 250 to 400 degree celsius as the solid fuel begin to decompose releasing the volatiles and during this initial stage carbon monoxide and the carbon dioxide are the primary volatiles released during this early pyrolysis stage followed by rapid production of carbon monoxide carbon dioxide hydrocarbon vapors tar and hydrogen in the temperature range of 700 to 900 degree celsius and above 900 degree celsius the pyrolysis completes resulting into a char as a product and followed by that is the oxidation zone in which the ignition of the early volatiles occurs in the temperature range of 400 to 600 degree celsius followed by the burning of carbon monoxide hydrocarbons and tar in the temperature range of 400 to 900 degree celsius and above this 900 degree celsius the char continues to burn and only ash remains at the end of the oxidation zone so in this case the small and the porous particles these dries before pyrolysis and the oxidation and this drying and the pyrolysis period is longer than the char oxidation for biomass as a solid fuel however in case of coal the char oxidation period is longer than the drying and the pyrolysis of the coal sample and if the larger and the less porous particles undergoes drying pyrolysis and the char oxidation simultaneously and for that reason small and the porous particles are used during this process so now let us try to understand this combustion model and its reaction pathways so this schematic here it represent the overall schematic of solid fuel combustion here the first stage is drying stage during this drying process moisture in the feed that is free or the bound moisture released by the application of heat to the sample and the next stage is a pyrolysis stage in which the pyrolysis of the solid fuel particle produces the volatiles including both non condensable and the condensable gases the condensable includes both 
lighter and the heavy molecules such as naphthalene anthracene fluorine and other gases and the tar produced by pyrolysis are very large molecules and thus the secondary reaction of tar it increases the volatiles as well as the char yield during the secondary cracking reaction and this produce volatiles undergo flame combustion as shown here in the schematic with adequate supply of oxygen or air while this char containing a fixed carbon shows glowing combustion as shown here in the schematic with application of heat and adequate supply of air or oxygen and this post oxidation or we can say the combustion process it releases flue gas along with significant amount of the heat as a product and the solid remains as ash so now after understanding about this reaction pathways let us try to understand this combustion model taking a single fuel particle into consideration so once this portion of the solid fuel particle reaches the reaction temperature then the fuel undergoes pyrolysis to form volatiles and char as a product so it forms these volatiles which are shown here and the char as a product and the specific location where the thermal degradation reaction occurs is called as a active pyrolysis zone here and a very sharp and the distinct interface between this unreacted zone and the pyrolysis zone it moves as a function of the temperature gradient and is termed as pyrolysis reaction front so this particular portion in the schematic represent as pyrolysis reaction front the initial reaction of the coal to metaplast can be considered as pyrolysis initiation if you look at this particular slide here so this initial reaction of coal to metaplast it can be considered as a pyrolysis initiation and the degradation of the metaplast can be considered as a subsequent pyrolysis reaction that is this metaplast it degrades to form volatiles tar and the char as a product and this can be considered as a subsequent pyrolysis reaction and the pyrolysis it involves both chemical and the physical changes and the physical change includes the particle shrinkage in coal and biomass the pyrolysis becomes heat transfer limited at around 500 degree celsius and the volatiles released during this process they consume oxygen being transported towards the surface of the particle and forms the combustion product along with the heat and this char oxidation it does not proceed until the volatile evaporation completes and the char oxidation process is influenced by the fuel particle diameter temperature and the oxygen availability and in this case the availability of the oxygen is a important step here because of insufficient supply of the oxygen it may results into the incomplete combustion and will release only carbon monoxide as a product along with the relatively less amount of the heat than that of the completely combusted product and that is termed as a combustion chemistry so let us discuss about this combustion chemistry in more detail during this combustion process the oxygen of the air it reacts with the combustible substances that is fuel so here we are referring it as a coal and results into the formation of combustion gases that is 
CO2, carbon monoxide, sulfur dioxide and H2O and here we are referring to sulfur dioxide because as we know the coal sample contains certain amount of the sulfur in its composition. So, as a result the sulfur dioxide will be present in the combustion product gaseous stream and along with that it releases significant amount of the heat. However, in some cases the pure oxygen gas is also used as a oxidizer for the combustion of a fuel or normally the air being used as a oxidizer for the fuel combustion. Air is assumed to contain 21 percent of the oxygen and 79 percent of nitrogen with traces of the other gases and the presence of this nitrogen in the oxidizer it reduces the combustion efficiency by absorbing the heat produced during the combustion of a fuel and also results in diluting the flue gases. Since this nitrogen does not take part into the combustion process so it leaves as it is along with the product gases that is flue gases without getting reacted. And hence it increases the volume of combustion byproducts. Moreover, this nitrogen also can combine with the oxygen that is at relatively a higher temperature that is a flame temperature to produce a toxic pollutant in the form of NOx which is consisting of nitric oxide and nitrogen dioxide via various mechanism that is endothermic reactions. And if you recollect our discussion in one of the module, we discuss about the combustion of the solid fuels and there we learned that the elements such as carbon, hydrogen and sulfur in solid fuel only take part into the combustion or you can say the oxidation reaction and the other elements does not take part into the combustion and the oxidation reaction. And when the solid fuel is used for the combustion process, so the carbon, hydrogen and sulfur get oxidized to produce carbon monoxide. If it is partially oxidized then it produces the carbon monoxide as a product or it will form CO2, water vapor and sulfur dioxide as a product. So, for example, here if the carbon present in the solid fuel is completely oxidized or combusted in presence of adequate supply of oxygen or the air then it produces CO2 as a product along with that it releases this much amount of the energy and in case if the carbon in the fuel is partially oxidized and that is mainly due to inadequate supply of oxygen or air during the combustion process then it may result into the formation of carbon monoxide and in this process this much amount of energy gets released. However, in case of sulphur, the sulphur is oxidized completely to produce sulphur dioxide and this much amount of the energy. Similarly, the hydrogen in the solid fuel get oxidized to produce water vapor and this much heat energy. So, here if you look at this reaction number 2, so for this each mole of CO form means a loss of around 283 kilojoule of heat and this heat can be recovered if CO is completely oxidized further in the combustion process to produce CO2 as a product and during this process it release out 283 kilojoule per mole of heat. So, once we combine these two heat values that is 283 plus 110.5 it comes out to be 393.5 kilojoule per mole and that is the amount of energy which gets released if the carbon in the fuel is completely oxidized in presence of adequate supply of oxygen and air to produce CO2 as a product 
and during this reaction it releases this much amount of the energy however in case if the partial combustion of the carbon occurs during the combustion process then it will release only 110.5 kJ per mole of heat energy and that's why it is termed as a loss of around 283 kJ per mole of energy due to this partial oxidation or the partial combustion of carbon during the combustion process and this can be recovered by completely oxidizing the carbon monoxide further in the combustion process by this reaction as it is represented here and this combustion of the solid fuels is more complex than that of the liquid and the gaseous fuel and that is mainly due to the complex chemical composition of the solid fuels and normally the coal and the biomass sample is represented as per the following chemical formula that is C A H B O C and the stoichiometry of combustion of this hydrocarbon fuel with adequate supply of oxygen can be described as follows so normally the combustion of hydrocarbon fuel it represented as c suffix x and h suffix y and it can be described as follows that is c a h b and if this hydrocarbon fuel is oxidized with adequate supply of oxygen then it produces y moles of co2 plus z mole of water vapor now by mass balance in equation 6 the carbon balance for example here so a is equal to y in terms of the h balance so b equal to 2 into z and you can also rearrange this term here that is z equal to b by 2 and the oxygen balance that is 2 into n 2 into y and z equal to we can just rearrange this term and it comes out to be n equal to a plus b by 4 and once we substitute this term in equation number 6 so the modified form of the equation 6 is represented in this way c a h b plus this is a value of n that means this many moles of oxygen required to completely oxidize this hydrocarbon fuel to form a moles of co2 and b by 2 moles of h2o and along with that it releases significant amount of the heat energy so here we just try to bring this entire equation in the form of a and b and as we know the biomass and the coal contains large amount of the oxygen and that is what i mentioned in the previous slide normally the biomass and the coal is represented as per the following chemical formula that is c h and o and if instead of the hydrocarbon we consider the biomass or coal as a fuel for the combustion operation then it is represented as c a h b o c so there is large amount of the oxygen is present in the feed sample itself and therefore this above equation this can be modified in this form so the value of n also will get modified it will be a plus b by 4 minus c by 2 that is because of the presence of oxygen in the feed sample and it will give a moles of co2 and b by 2 moles of h2o and in this case we have to make one more assumption here that all the fuel and the oxidizers are completely combusted or oxidized to form the product as a result the oxygen is not seen in the product stream 
that means the entire oxidizer or you can say the oxidant is completely utilized during this combustion process along with the fuel to produce product and hence the oxygen cannot be seen in the product stream. So now suppose instead of oxygen if air is used as a oxidizer or oxidizing agent during the combustion process. So there will be a change in this equation number 7 and 8 because as we know the composition of the air on molar or volume basis it contains 20.9% oxygen and 78.1% nitrogen and remaining 0.9% is other gases. However, when we consider air as a oxidizer or oxidant for the combustion process, so normally we neglect the composition of other gases while doing the calculation of stoichiometric amount of the air which is required for the combustion process. And the summation of these three comes out to be around 100 percent that is on the volume basis. And hence this oxygen and the nitrogen are approximated to 21 percent oxygen and 79 percent nitrogen. And normally during the combustion process while calculating the stoichiometric amount of the air which is required for the combustion process. So, these other gases are neglected during the calculation and hence this percentage oxygen and percentage nitrogen can be approximated to 21 percent oxygen and 79 percent nitrogen and that is by molar or volume basis. And thus one mole of oxygen here it is accompanied by 3.76 moles of nitrogen that is 0.79 divided by 0.21 which comes out to be around 3.76 moles of nitrogen. So, with the help of this given information now the equation 7 can be rewritten as so this is a fuel which is oxidized using air as a oxidant. So, now here this component represent air However, in the equation 7 if you remember it was just the pure oxygen, but since now the oxygen is replaced with air as an oxidant, so this term here it represents the air and it forms CO2, H2O and along with that now the additional term coming in this equation 9 is nitrogen. However, it was absent when pure oxygen is used as a oxidizing medium during the combustion process, but due to use of air as an oxidant since as I mentioned earlier the 1 mole of oxygen it is accompanied by 3.76 moles of nitrogen and this nitrogen does not take part during the combustion process and it remains unaffected during the combustion process. As a result, we can see here these many moles of nitrogen are coming out as it is along with the other combustible product that is CO2 and H2O and hence it dilutes the product gases as well as it increases the volume of product gas. And similarly the equation 8 can be rewritten in the following way. Here the only difference is the oxygen is present in the feedstock. And thus the amount of air which is required for combusting a stoichiometric amount of mixture is called as a stoichiometric or the theoretical air and in the equation 9 the term A plus B by 4 indicates the moles of stoichiometric amount of the air which is required for the complete oxidation of 
one mole of fuel that is hydrocarbon fuel. And similarly, in equation 10, if you see here A plus B by 4 minus C by 2 moles of stoichiometric amount of air which is required for the complete oxidation of 1 mole of fuel that is C A H B and O suffix C because here the oxygen is already present in the feed material. And even the moisture and the humidity can also be added to oxidant as some fraction of moles of oxygen, but normally these terms are neglected during the calculation of the stoichiometric amount of the air which is required for the combustion of a specific fuel. Now similarly this relative mass of molecules can be obtained by simply multiplying the moles of each species in the molecule by their molecular weights. Say for example here as the stoichiometric amount of the air need to be calculated that is on the mass basis. So, it can be calculated like this. So, it can be calculated as mass of air that is the stoichiometric quantity equal to number of moles of air into its molecular weight that is the stoichiometric quantity. And the molecular weight of the air as we know it is a mixture of nitrogen and the oxygen. So, it can be calculated using this equation that is summation of fraction of specific species multiplied by its relative molecular weight. So, this indicates the fraction of oxygen into its molecular weight plus fraction of nitrogen into its molecular weight. And as we discussed earlier air contain approximately 21 percent oxygen and 79 percent nitrogen. So, with the help of this given information and the molecular weight of oxygen is 32 gram per mole and the nitrogen is 28.01 gram per mole. So, once we substitute this value in the above equation that is equation of molecular weight of air it comes out to be around 28.85 gram per mole and it can be approximated to 29 gram per mole. And now we can calculate the composition of air by mass that is oxygen is 0.21 into its molecular weight divided by the molecular weight of air and it comes out to be around 23 percent approximately and similarly the nitrogen it comes out to be around 77 percent approximately. But remember that this is by mass and this is by mole or volume. So, there is another important concept in the combustion stoichiometry that is termed as percentage excess air. Practically fuels are often combusted in amount of air different than that of the stoichiometric ratio. And in case if actual air used is less than the stoichiometric amount of air then the mixture is described as fuel rich mixture which indicates that the amount of air which is used during this combustion operation is less than the stoichiometric amount of air required for the combustion as a result the mixture is fuel rich mixture. So, mixture here in the sense is the combustible mixture. So, in that combustible mixture it is a 
fuel rich mixture that means the percentage of fuel is more than that of the amount of air which is required for the combustion and these fuel rich mixtures are less efficient but may produce more power and burn cooler or in case if actual air if actual air used is in excess then the mixture is described as fuel lean mixture so which indicates that the air which is used during this combustion it is in excess of that of the fuel and as a result the combustible mixture is fuel lean mixture that means the amount of fuel is less than that of the amount of air which is being used during this combustion operation and this fuel lean mixture these are more efficient but may cause higher temperatures which can lead to the formation of nitrogen oxides and therefore to ensure complete combustion the actual air is supplied is in excess of stoichiometric air and this amount of air in excess in excess of the stoichiometric amount is called excess air so basically the amount of air which is used in excess of the stoichiometric amount of the air which is required for the combustion operation and that's why it is termed as excess air and this percentage excess air can be calculated using this equation that is mass of air actually which is required for the combustion minus mass of air stoichiometric amount divided by mass of air stoichiometric amount into 100 so if you just simply rearrange this equation so it will be mass of air actual by mass of air stoichiometric amount minus mass of air stoichiometric amount divided by mass of air stoichiometric we have just separated this term here so this will cancel out and we will get the equation in the form of mass of air that is actual amount mass of air stoichiometric amount minus 1 into 100 so this gives percentage excess air which is required during the combustion operation 
and here the subscript indicates actual and indicates stoichiometric amount and thus to quantify this combustible mixture the fuel to air ratio and equivalence ratio are introduced and these are important aspect of the combustion operation that ensures efficient and safe combustion so let us first discuss about this fuel to air ratio so let us first discuss about fuel to air ratio and this particular ratio that is fuel to air ratio and equivalence ratio are introduced to quantify the combustible mixtures for example fuel to air ratio that is also abbreviated as far for actual amount of air it is represented as f that is fuel to air ratio actual equal to mass of fuel by mass of air and this is on actual basis similarly stoichiometric air can be represented in the form of fuel to air ratio stoichiometric amount is a ratio of is a ratio of mass of fuel by mass of air and this is stoichiometric amount and if you recollect our discussion just few slides back we described the combustion of hydrocarbon for air as an oxidant and the equation is represented in the form that is plus into 3.76 and this term here it represent air as oxidant it gives a amount of co2 plus b by 2 h2o plus 3.76 nitrogen similarly for biomass and coal as a solid fuel the equation can be represented in the form there we need to consider the percentage oxygen which is present in the specific given solid sample either it is biomass or coal and it gives plus water plus 
a plus b by 4 minus nitrogen also here if you see this one mole of oxygen is accompanied by 3.76 moles of nitrogen and it comes out to be 4.76 moles of air. So, for example, here if the solid fuel used is biomass or coal, then then the moles of air required for the combustion of the given solid fuel is this much into 4.76 because as I mentioned, one mole of oxygen accompanied by 3.76 moles of nitrogen that means 4.76 into these many moles of air is required to carry out the combustion of the given solid fuel. And this fuel to air ratio based on the stoichiometric amount of air is represented in the following way a plus b by 4 minus c by 2 into 4.76 and this is molecular weight of air and this total it is based on the stoichiometric amount of air which is required for combusting this much mass of fuel and this equation we can number it as 15 and the range of this fuel to air ratio is from 0 to infinity and in the similar line the air to fuel ratio that is represented as a f r so this is fuel to air ratio similarly the air to fuel ratio is also used to describe combustible mixture and which is simply the reciprocal of fuel to air ratio So, for example, once we know fuel to air ratio, then air to fuel ratio is simply the reciprocal of and that is the stoichiometric fuel to air ratio. So, please make a note of one thing here that is this air to fuel ratio and fuel to air ratio are in the terms of mass ratios. So, this is all about the fuel to air ratio. Similarly, 
the equivalence ratio is another one important concept in the combustion stoichiometry. So, this equivalence ratio also denoted as phi and lambda. The equivalence ratio it can be calculated by normalizing the actual fuel to air ratio by the stoichiometric by the stoichiometric fuel to air ratio. So, if you just divide the actual fuel to air ratio by the stoichiometric fuel to air ratio, it gives the equivalence ratio. And this equivalence ratio is represented using this equation that is fuel to air ratio actual by fuel to air ratio stoichiometric amount. So, this equivalence ratio phi can be represented by using this equation that is fuel to air ratio actual by fuel to air ratio stoichiometric quantity that is equal to mass of air stoichiometric quantity divided by mass of air that is actual. And so, just to know how we have reached to this particular term here, we can simply solve this equation that is fuel to air actual is equal to mass of fuel by mass of air actual and fuel to air ratio stoichiometric equal to mass of fuel by mass of air stoichiometric quantity and if you replace these two equation in the above equation that is phi equal to mass of fuel by mass of air actual by mass of fuel mass of air stoichiometric quantity and just rearranging this equation this mass of fuel this will get cancel out here it will get mass you will get the equation in the form of this mass of fuel will cancel out and will get the equation in the form of mass of air stoichiometry by mass of air actual. So, this is the term as we have mentioned in the previous equation and similarly this can be represented in the form of moles of air by actual and in case if the oxygen is used as an oxidant then so this is the actual and this is stoichiometric quantity now in this case if this phi is less than 1 
and it is termed as fuel lean mixture or if phi is equal to 1 then it is a stoichiometric mixture and in case if the phi is greater than 1 then it is fuel rich mixture. So, similar to this fuel to L ratio this equivalence ratio that is phi also ranges from zero to infinity and that is corresponding to to the limits of and that is corresponding to the limits of pure air and fuel. respectively and alternatively an equivalence ratio based on air to fuel ratio is frequently used by combustion scientist and is denoted by lambda and this lambda here is defined as as the ratio of the actual air to fuel ratio to the stoichiometric air to fuel ratio so the equivalence ratio that is in the form of lambda it can be represented in the form of air to fuel ratio this is actual by air to fuel ratio stoichiometric quantity that is equal to mass of air divided by mass of air stoichiometric quantity and if you remember the previous equation that is phi it is the ratio of mass of air that is stoichiometric to the mass of air actual and here it is just reverse of that and that is the reason the lambda is inverse of phi and if this lambda is less than 1 then it is a fuel rich mixture 
and if it is equal to 1, it is a stoichiometric mixture and if it is greater than 1, then it is fuel in mixture. So, this is all about the combustion stoichiometry and I hope it is clear now how to calculate the fuel to air ratio as well as air to fuel ratio, equivalence ratio and the percentage excess air for the given fuel and how to represent the combustion stoichiometry for the given fuel if it is a biomass or if it is just the hydrocarbon fuel. Since we know the biomass and coal contains oxygen in its composition therefore, the combustion equation for the biomass as well as the coal is different than that of the pure hydrocarbon fuels. This is all about the combustion stoichiometry. So, in the next lecture we will practice few example on the concept covered in this module. Thank you. Thank you.